Welcome to the Explores. Time traveling through history, one era at a time. I'm Kate Armstrong. A woman enters a church for her coronation, dressed head to toe in glimmering gold. She kneels at the altar beside her husband, ready to be anointed. A hush hangs on the incense-scented air as her people watch, enthralled. Years ago, as a teenager, she watched her mother and father kneel in the same spot, and now it's her turn. She will be the first queen regnant crowned in her region, just as her father promised. But to hold onto her crown and her power will take every ounce of passion, devotion, and fiery will within her. Join me, won't you, as we travel back to the Middle Ages, to the Crusader states of Outremer, and meet four headstrong princesses. Four women who fought for power, for independence, and for the right to rule their worlds. Luckily for us, we have a special guest along for the journey today. Author and historian Catherine Pangonis. Her book, Queens of Jerusalem, details the lives and times of these queens in fascinating detail, and it makes for an excellent read. Now, grab your crown, your sword, and your fanciest psalter. Let's go traveling. But first, a shout out to some of my patrons. My newest pirate queen, Chelsea. My warrior queens, Alexis, Amanda, Ika, Jessica, June, Neve, and Sloan, Samantha, and Sarah. My imperial empresses, Bridget, Alyssa, Faye and Whimsy Soapworks, Katie, Samara, and Teresa. And my lady pharaohs, Cheryl, Cot, Kate, Kimberly, Laura, Lori, Sophie, and the fabulous Courtney's. This show just wouldn't be possible without the generous support of all my patrons. For just a few dollars a month, they get each episode early and ad-free, discounts on merch, full interviews with guests, and exclusive bonus episodes. I'm about to share one about another Middle Eastern queen, al Kaiseron, which is full of all the best kinds of drama. To find out more, just go to my website. Before we start, a quick content warning. In this episode, we'll be exploring a fraught and bloody time in the Levant's history, the Crusades. There will be some discussion of religious warfare and genocide in the areas we now know as Israel and Palestine. Let's touch down in 1095 AD in a swath of land that runs along the Mediterranean coastline, a narrow band of what has always been hotly contested territory that runs from southern Turkey down to northern Egypt. Before it was called the Middle East or the Levant, Europeans called this region by another name, Outremer, which translates from French as oversea or land beyond the sea. Followers of Christianity, Judaism, and Islam have long considered these lands holy and desired to make pilgrimage to them. Since antiquity, the area around the city of Jerusalem has been taken and retaken, sacked and seized over and over again. It has seen many rulers, the Egyptians, the Jews, the Assyrians, the Persians, the Greeks, the Romans, the Byzantines, and Arab Muslims. In the 12th century, Western Christians decided it was time to take it back from that last. In 1095, Pope Urban II gave a speech that roused thousands to journey eastward to liberate the holy places from the Muslims who had taken them. It was, he said, a divinely sanctioned mission. He promised absolution from sin and a place in heaven to any Christian who took up the cross. Here's Catherine. So the Crusaders, they were essentially Europeans who, following a call, a call to action from the Pope and a number of incentives, both financial and spiritual, journeyed to the Middle East to try and retake Jerusalem 
from from the Muslims who were holding it at this time, from the Seljuks, and there are a variety of different Muslim dynasties in this in this region at this time. And they they were successful against the odds. They managed to carve their way, despite a lot of hardship and a lot of defeats, they managed to carve their way across Anatolia and into the Holy Land and eventually capture Jerusalem. Many men, both highborn and low, heeded that call, marching east for faith, glory, and salvation. The first of what will be many Crusades had begun. When we think of the Crusades, we picture a sea of men in shiny codpieces. No? Just me? The truth is that plenty of women got involved in the Crusades as well. You know, women were playing quite important roles in the Crusades, not, not specifically in fighting, but in, in organizing them and funding them and, and holding the fort at home and governing the Crusader states in the East. Some of them marched to the Crusades alongside husbands and brothers, despite the fact the church actively discouraged them. Robert of Reims once wrote that the Pope thought female participants without a proper chaperone were more hindrance than help, a burden rather than a benefit. Rude. The Pope also suspected they would corrupt the whole mission. After all, Crusader men are supposed to be focused on the holy, and having their ladies and their lady parts along in their tents would only tempt these soldiers into carnal lust. And yet, according to research done by historian Natasha Hodgson, at least 91 women took up the cross anyway. During the Second Crusade, the Queen of France, Eleanor of Aquitaine, will follow her husband to Jerusalem, taking a retainer of royal women with her. Some women served as camp followers, making meals, doing laundry, and nursing the wounded. In other words, all the stuff the men don't want to do. In dire situations, they went out into the battle to bring wounded men water and defended camps themselves. Not that any of the chroniclers want to talk about that noise. Guibert de Nogan wrote that Saracen women rocked up to the siege of Antioch in 1097 carrying bows, arrows, and quivers. We have little evidence that any strapped on armor and actually fought, but women on all sides of the conflict, especially those being besieged, must have fought back in any way they could. Jewish chronicler Solomon Bar Simpson describes Jewish women hurling stones and insults at crusaders from their windows, and having rocks thrown back at them in return. Meanwhile, at home in the West, women took up the reins of business and estate running, and sent money to sponsor the crusaders. In the East, some helped plan sieges, shore up fortifications, and arrange the payment of ransoms to get their husbands out of enemy prisons. There's no denying that women of all faiths and ethnicities suffer during the Crusades. Non-Christian, non-combatant women often suffer most of all. Whether active participants or unwilling bystanders, many are assaulted, imprisoned, murdered, and forced into slavery. This was all considered somewhat par for the warring course in ancient and medieval times, but that doesn't mean we have to like it. In 1099, the Crusaders reached Jerusalem, which they sought to take over a long, five-week siege. It was, by all accounts, a bloodbath. Ralph of Seine saw The scurrying people, the fortified towers, the roused garrison, the men rushing to arms, the women in tears, the priests turned to their prayers, the streets ringing with cries, crashing, clanging, and neighing. And though we have reason for doubting this little note from chronicler William of Tyre, including the fact that he wasn't present at the siege of Jerusalem, Even women, regardless of sex and natural weakness, dare to ask your moms and fought manfully, far beyond their strength. Thousands of Muslims and Jews were slaughtered. The Crusaders' surprise win really rocked the world, both East and West. To Christians, it seemed like a message from God that, yeah, we're totally meant to be doing this. Many crusaders marched home when it was over, but some stayed to set up territories and defend them. Four crusader states were carved out of the aftermath. The county of Edessa, the principality of Antioch, the county of Tripoli, and the kingdom of Jerusalem. Each one needed a leader to hold on to what they'd won. A council gets together and decides the leader of Jerusalem should be Godfrey of Bouillon, one of the crusaders who played a fundamental role in the city's conquest. He doesn't want to be its king, though. 
After all, he says, it doesn't feel right to wear a crown of gold in the city where Jesus wore a crown of thorns. And so he becomes Advocatus Sancti Sepulchri, advocate or defender of the Holy Sepulchre. He dies in 1100 to be succeeded by his brother, Baldwin, who is more than happy to take the title King of Jerusalem. But it won't be long before his relative, Baldwin II, the patriarch of our story, will step into his shoes. The world our four princesses are born into is, to put it mildly, full of conflict. You've got the obvious religious tensions, but you also have a lot of cultural mingling and exchange as well. It's a land where Jews, Christians, and Muslims all interact, often living in a state of fractious and uneasy peace. And our ladies are going to grow up fighters. The Middle Ages are, shall we say, not a particularly liberated time for women. In Outremer, which is dominated by Western European modes of thinking, the central belief is that women are best for childbearing and their ability to transmit land and goods through marriage. They don't have a lot of rights when it comes to inheritance laws or personal freedoms. Play your cards wrong, my married friends, and you might just find yourself without a nose. One of the early kings of Jerusalem presides over the council, the, the Concordat of Nablus, which establishes a lot of rules, like social rules, for how the kingdom of Jerusalem will be governed. Um, and in it, you know, they are talking about the practice of rhinotomy for adultery. Now, rhinotomy is the practice of cutting off the nose. So it's still a highly oppressive society. If a woman's caught in adultery, her nose is chopped off. It's that sort of thing. Um, and, you know, it's these sort of very sort of biblical, uh, you know, brutal rules you know, inhibiting the freedoms of women. So it's, it's certainly not progressive in that respect. But this is also a frontier, a place where rules are bent and often broken. It's also a land in a constant state of tension and flux, with raids and invasions always on the horizon. And that means the sons of important knights tend to die young. Daughters are the ones who provide a sense of stability and continuity the men around them can't. This is a community, a kingdom, states founded on hugely volatile lands where they're an invading force fighting to remain there against sort of hostile enemies on all sides. And this means that they are more desperate. You know, they are, they, they you know, circumstances force them to adapt. And what's very important, you know, they don't have loads of dynasties and eligible rulers waiting around the corner. And... The prestige of the knights who conquered the land, the knights of the First Crusade, is very important. And it just so happens that these men, these First Crusaders, they have more, they either die childless or they have more daughters than sons. And the sons they do have tend to get slaughtered on the battlefield or die of disease. So you have a much higher survival rate for these female children, which means that the Crusader states have to sort of choose between swallowing this bitter pill of accepting sort of female rule and female you know, females having a place in politics, or losing the bloodline of the, the men who founded their states and who conquered the territory. And in quite a lot of cases, they are on the side of, you know, pr protecting the bloodline, protecting the pedigree, and allowing women to take on these positions of power. Jerusalem's first sort of king survives just under a year. So he is succeeded by his brother, Baldwin of Bologna. But then he dies without any male issue, so the court, called the Hot Corps, looks around for his closest relative. In 1118, another Baldwin, the Count of Edessa, takes the throne as Baldwin II. He is originally from the county of Rethel in France, a second son who knew he wasn't likely to inherit much. So he thought he'd try his luck as a crusader. He fought hard, spent years as a prisoner of war, and eventually became the Count of Edessa. He also married Morphia of Melitene, daughter of an Armenian prince. She's Greek Orthodox in faith, but very much a Middle Eastern woman. Such marriages between local ladies and Europeans are strategic, meant to cement alliances and calm down some of the tension in Outremer. Baldwin I, technically the first Christian king of Jerusalem, did exactly this when he married a local Armenian noblewoman named Arit. She brought political shorty and a heap of money to the marriage. And he brought, well, more on that in a little bit. 
Baldwin II and his bride may have been a political alliance, but it seems they quickly became devoted to each other. When Baldwin was captured and held captive for four years, Morphia waited for him in Edessa and played a key role in bargaining for his release. During that time, she also bears their first child, their daughter Melisande. Baldwin won't meet her until she's three years old, but he is immediately smitten. Father and daughter will only grow closer in the years to come. Reunited, Baldwin and Morphia have two more headstrong girls, with a fourth soon to follow, each one a tiny symbol of the Crusades. They're natives of the Middle East, um, born to you know, a local Armenian mother and uh, you know, an invading Frankish Catholic Christian father. Um, this is the world they're born into, and it's, it's, it's rife with religious conflict but it's also a very sort of spiritual world and multi-ethnic. And they sort of are a symbol of the Crusader states because they're the symbol of this fusion between the East and the Western Christians and these alliances that they make and, and the settlements they made over there. On Christmas Day, 1118, at the Church of the Nativity in Bethlehem, Baldwin II and his fine lady are crowned and anointed with holy oil. Baldwin delays the coronation so all his girls can travel to be in attendance. Melisande, age 13, Alice, age 8, and Hodierna, age 7, all look on, likely awed by the spectacle. I doubt any of them suspect that they will one day fight for, and sometimes against, each other, and that one of them will come to rule Jerusalem more or less on her own. Why, hello there! This is just a quick reminder to tell you all the ways you can support the Explores. Check out my shop, where you can buy Explores merchandise and original lady-centric maps, timelines, and art prints, featuring ladies from Tudor England, Ancient Rome, and beyond. Become a patron of the show. Buy my novel, Nightbirds, or pre-order its sequel, Firebirds, out later this year. Simply listening is a huge support as well, so thank you just for being here. Let's look at some of the good stuff about Baldwin II. His predecessor, as we'll soon find out, was kind of an asshole, so the bar is pretty close to the mosaic tiling when this guy hits the scene. He is said to be genuinely pious. He successfully defends his borders and rules with a steady and clever hand. We also like him because he is a devoted husband to Morphia, even though she gives him nothing but daughters. Turns out he quite likes his little girls, too. He brings Melisande along to all of his meetings, making no secret of the fact that he's prepping her to be his successor. She was raised at, you know, at her father's knee. If you like. she, learned, she learned the trade of, of ruling government firsthand from a very able king and was clearly educated and prepared for rule from a young age. She wasn't sent away to be raised in a convent. She was raised at the court. And we know that she was attending meetings of the High Council from her teens, you know, being groomed to understand the politics, being groomed for succession. She takes precedence above other nobles in ceremonial occasions and becomes tied with her father on official documents, slapping her name on the granting of fiefdoms and diplomatic correspondence. In other words, she gets more training than most firstborn sons of royal rulers, and she's not at all afraid to take that role head on. She's clearly a very driven and ambitious woman who's not willing to roll over and be passed over. Um, and we see this trait common in all of her sisters as well. They're, they're, a, very, they're a very plucky set of sisters, um, and who certainly, they're certainly not prepared to surrender agency or to settle for less than what they're due, and they will fight their corners. But even with loving parents and their exalted status, they can't always escape the violence around them. Two years after Baldwin II is crowned, he and Morphia have a fourth daughter, Yvette. In 1123, when she's about three years old, Baldwin II ends up getting captured by Muslim forces, again. Morphia devises a daring rescue plan, but it fails to deliver. 
And so she and one of Baldwin's men go to negotiate with the Muslim leader, who demands money, land, and a hostage, Yvette. Why her? Perhaps because she's the only daughter born to them while Baldwin was officially the King of Jerusalem, making her the most symbolically impactful. She's actually traded as a hostage in her infancy. Her father actually swaps her for it to buy his freedom, and so puts her into the, the, the control, the captivity of a Turkish emir um, as sort of you know, a down payment or a ransom. The whole business has to take a huge toll on the family including the elder three daughters, who watch helplessly as their baby sister is sent to the people they see as the enemy. And then Baldwin too takes a huge risk, going against the terms of their agreement and putting his daughter's life in utter peril. It's hard to know what Yvette suffers in her captivity. One contemporary source suggests that she's violated. But given that she's quite tiny, and this was probably written to inspire more people to become crusaders, we have to take it with a giant grain of salt. Forevermore, though, Yvette will have to live with knowing that her parents traded her freedom away for Baldwin's. Sort of seems awful, um, and was pretty awful for her because it meant she could never marry. She was sort of symbolically tainted by that period in captivity. Morphia dies just a few years later, to be mourned by her husband and their daughters. It's very clear to everyone in Jerusalem that Baldwin II, unless he marries again, will have no sons. What do we know about these girls' interests, or about what they looked like? Precious little, though certainly the most about Melisande. From some of William of Tyre's descriptions, we can surmise that she's thin and athletic, with pale skin and golden hair. We also know that she is, like all of her sisters, passionate, someone who isn't afraid of her feelings and sharing them, particularly when she's angry. We also know that Baldwin II raised his eldest daughter to follow in his footsteps and makes no qualms about that intention. She also enjoys the support of the hot core. This royal council, composed of the nobility and clergy, has the power to make or break a ruler of Outremer. Though the kingship is hereditary, it's partially elective. You can't get by, as a monarch, unless they give you their official blessing. It's telling that the king of Jerusalem is considered a primus inter pares, or first among equals. Melisande has her father's backing and their good opinion. And the church likes her too. If anyone's going to become Outremer's first outright lady ruler, it's definitely her. And why not? No clear rules have been established in the Latin East when it comes to succession. Back west, Raka of Castile became Europe's first queen regnant in 1080, and Eleanor of Aquitaine's dad made her queen upon his death. And Melisande is a daughter of the region, seen as one of its rightful royals. So despite the fact that his, his children are, are female, they're daughters, they're quite well placed to command loyalty in the kingdom of Jerusalem because they have this connection to the Eastern Christians as well. And as I've mentioned, they sort of do represent the fusion of these cultures and the, set, um, and the sort of settler ethos of the Knights of the First Crusade. But even Baldwin II knows that to name his daughter sole ruler is going to be a bridge too far for most. So he decides to find her a husband who will be a powerful ally, one the nobles will accept, who can protect her inheritance and safeguard any future heirs. Enter Folk V, Count of Anjou and Maine. He is well-connected, an experienced soldier, and has plenty of money. He is also father-in-law to Princess Matilda, next in line to inherit the English throne. But here's the rub. He only wants to marry Mel on the condition that he will be the one to rule. Though Melisande should, by right, be recognized as Jerusalem's queen regnant, it's common practice that she not exercise her authority directly. Folk would do that through the rights of the wife, called jure uxoris. Baldwin II agrees to this, though he's clearly reluctant. We can imagine how headstrong, entitled Melisande must feel about this move. I'll tell you how I feel about it. Not good. Even so, in June 1129, Melisande and Falk are married. 
and the paperwork says Folk's the one who will inherit Baldwin II's power when he dies. Mel makes sure to walk down the aisle looking every inch a queen, though. She was most elegantly garbed in a beautiful dress from which trailed a long train of golden silk. One Muslim travel writer said, Proud she was in her ornaments and dress, walking with the little steps of a half-span, like a dove, or in the manner of a wisp of cloud. God protect us from the seduction of the sight. Melisande and Folk's marriage starts off well enough. By 1130, they've already had a son, the future Baldwin III. But not all is well within this family. In fact, one of its daughters is about to start a war. Alice, the second daughter, was the first one to marry. In 1127, at just 16 years old, she married Bohemond II, the Prince of Antioch. He was a 22-year-old blonde hunk who seemed delighted by his bride. She moved with him to the city of Antioch, which is a hub of art and culture. Before long, they've had a daughter, Constance, and everything is good in her world, right? Well, the thing is that her bloodthirsty husband, like so many crusaders, is often gone from home a-warring. And while he's off, he does not cede any power to his ambitious, increasingly frustrated wife. We can see just how much Alice felt she should be ruling Antioch in what happens in 1131. That's when sexy Bohemond II is killed in battle, and Alice has some big decisions to make. When Bohemond first struck his marriage deal with Baldwin, Alice's father, he basically accepted his father-in-law's sovereignty over Antioch. And while the marriage contract said that, if Bohemond died, Alice would gain control of several important land holdings, the law also made her subject to the sovereign lord's will. That means dear old dad could marry her off again at his convenience, and she knows she is too important a political pawn to him to get to stay single. Apparently her union with hunky Bohemond wasn't all that great, because she is not into this idea, and she wants the city of Antioch for herself. She swiftly rejects Jerusalem's control, making herself the highest status woman in the city. This move isn't exactly illegal, and suggests she has some of the city's most powerful nobles behind her. Still, it's an act of open rebellion, both against Jerusalem and, shockingly, her father. A punch straight to the face of the patriarchy that sources of the day roundly criticize. As soon as it is learned of her husband's death, wrote William of Tyre. In fact, before she was aware of her father's intention to come to Antioch, an evil spirit led her to conceive a wicked plan. Whether she remained a widow or remarried, Alice determined to disinherit her daughter and keep the principality for herself in perpetuity. Both Baldwin II and Falk set off with an army, anxious to appoint a male regent to protect Alice's daughter Constance's interests. This, of course, is not good news for Alice. She has no army left. She needs to find someone else to fight for her. In a bit of a panic, she turns to Adebeg Zenji, a Muslim leader, offering to marry her precious daughter to a Muslim prince in exchange for aid. She sends her offer via a fine white horse and a messenger, but he's intercepted by Baldwin's men, tortured, and murdered. All in all, this is not a great look for Alice. By the time the force arrives in Antioch, Baldwin II is furious with his daughter. Alice doubles down by refusing to let him in through the city's gates. At just 20 years old, she commands her father to promise her independence in her rule of Antioch. It's bold, Alice. But it seems that some of the nobles inside the city are starting to turn against her. Or, as good old William of Tyre puts it, In that very city, where God-fearing men, contemptuous of the impudence and foolishness of a woman. Thanks, William. They open the gates, and Alice has to plead with her father for mercy. She's exiled from Antioch, but at least she gets to keep Latakia and Jabala, the cities that had been her dowry. Still, it must be a heavy blow. The sources are much less forgiving of Alice's power grab than they are of her sisters. Melisande's a woman who manages to wield power, but ultimately, within, within reason, plays by the rules, you know, she gives money to the church, her son, you know, despite that they have serious ups and downs, still, you know, still, they still have a close relationship, it seems, at points, whereas Alice just sort of goes, goes too far beyond the pale and is just a threat 
to the patriarchy. So as a result, yeah, she's treated appallingly in the Chronicles. She's she's called a bad mother. She's like, you know, she's depicted as sort of licentious, as silly, as unintelligent, um, as greedy, all these, all these, you know, negative things. Even modern historians tend to use quite quite derogatory language around her, calling her sort of flighty or meddlesome and things like this. So Alice becomes this victim of this very gendered language. Which goes to show that, while the rules may have been a little looser regarding women and power in Outremer, an ambitious woman needs to tread carefully. In August of 1131, shortly after returning from this little drama, Baldwin II's health starts fading. As he confesses his sins and thinks about Jerusalem's future, he finds himself rethinking his agreement with Folk. On his deathbed, Baldwin II called everyone around him, including Folk, including Melisande, including their, their son, Baldwin, the, you know, future Baldwin III, his grandson, and all the, the nobles in the area. And he sort of croaked out his dying wish, which was that power would not be given exclusively to Folk, as had been previously expected, but would be instead split in a triumvirate between Folk, Melisande, and baby Baldwin, meaning that Folk is actually only inheriting one third of the power that he thought he would, and that, in, well, in practice, one half, because, you know, that Baldwin III is a baby. But Melisande is given as much power, as much inherent political power as Fulk. And this, this is a problem for him, because he certainly didn't want to share power with his wife. To everyone in the medieval world, this seems like a bizarre decision. Why the sudden, radical change of heart? Well, first of all, he really likes his daughter and thinks she'll make a great leader. Always has done. But also, it could be more selfish in the fact that he wants to make sure his grandson inherits. He wants to make sure the throne of Jerusalem is tied to his bloodline. Because there's a danger in the Middle Ages, as has been seen actually with, with Baldwin's predecessor, Baldwin I. Remember how I said we'd be getting back to Baldwin I, the king who came before Baldwin II? That's because that guy set a really unfortunate precedent when it came to casting off wives. In other words, he abandoned them about as quickly as a used handkerchief. His second wife, Arit, was similar in many ways to Melisande's mother. She was an Armenian and well-connected. But when Baldwin I became king of Jerusalem, he left her behind in Edessa. Even when he brought her over to Jerusalem, it doesn't seem he took much care. Eight years into their marriage, he demanded an annulment, claiming Arit had been unfaithful to him as she traveled to Jerusalem. One source suggests she was ravaged, aka assaulted, by a pirate. Let's hope that little rumor isn't true. What is more likely true is that Baldwin felt Arit hadn't held up her end of the bargain. She didn't bring him the dowry he wanted and also didn't give him any sons. Henry VIII much? Arit had no way to fight back and was forced to take the veil and join a not-so-nice nunnery. Meanwhile, Baldwin I moved on right away, but his third wife still didn't give him any children. Sounds like a personal problem, Baldwin. He cast her off as well, and then had the audacity to try to get Arit to come back to be his queen again. Dude, are you for real? When it comes to folk, he already has some adult male children from a previous marriage, which has to worry Baldwin II a little. What's to stop him from pushing Melisande and any children they have aside in favor of transferring power in Jerusalem to his sons? The men who are unhappy with their wives can find ways to divorce them. Although divorce is not technically legal at this time, there are sort of back there are back doors to get what you want. There are loopholes. There's this. There's that. And it's actually not that difficult for a king to put his wife aside or send her to a convent and marry someone else and disinherit the children from the first marriage. So if Baldwin wants to be absolutely sure that the throne remains tied to his bloodline, this is the only way that he can really do that. It helps Melisande's case that a lot of the local nobles distrust folk, whereas they trust and know her. So there's a few reasons why Baldwin would make this decision. And the effect of it is that Melisande is suddenly in a position to step up and become Queen Regnant of Jerusalem, which is not something anyone saw coming. And it's going to change things for women in Outremer forever. This is only the beginning for Melisande and her sisters. 
In part two of Crusader Queens, we'll watch her settle into queenship and fight some epic battles with the men in her life. Get ready for scandal, duels, and a murder mystery or two. Until next time. Thanks for listening. If you like The Exploress, tell a friend about it, leave a review wherever you listen, become a patron of the show, or shoot me an email telling me what you love about it. Hearing from you truly does delight me. Make sure to check out Catherine's wonderful book, Queens of Jerusalem, wherever good books are sold. You can find show notes for this episode at my website, theexploresspodcast.com. That's also where you'll find links to my Patreon and The Exploress shop. You can also find me on Instagram at The Exploress Podcast. Much love to Carly Quinn for all her help with the show, to Josh Stackhouse for an amazing new theme song, and to the Tudor Consort for their beautiful choral music, which you can find in the show notes and at Free Music Archive online. Much love also goes to the following for their vocal stylings, Joffrey Kay and my brother John.